When I returned home from our week-long honeymoon, strange noises greeted me as I walked through the door. Anxiety set in. I feared that the house might have been broken into while we were away. Did you hear that? Maybe there's someone inside. Should we call the police? I asked my husband, but he dismissed my concerns with a calm, it's all right. He strode into the house, and I hurried after him, my heart racing. To my relief, it wasn't burglars but my mother-in-law Kelly and my sister-in-law Joe. They were inside, seemingly at ease. I was puzzled wondering why they were there. Apparently, they had volunteered to look after the house while we were gone, and my husband had given them a key. I had assumed they would leave once we returned. It's getting dark. If you don't go home soon, you'll be out of time, I suggested, hoping they'd take the hint. Instead of leaving, I settled in, commandeering the living room and even taking a shower without asking. I hoped they would depart the next morning, but when I came home from work, they were still there. Unable to tolerate the intrusion any longer, I asked my husband to ask them to leave. His response shocked me. We all live together now, so if you don't like it, you can leave. He was suggesting that I move out instead. I packed a few essentials and left with just a carry-on. My name is Izzy. I'm a 29-year-old magazine editor. Three years ago, I met my current husband, Alex, through a friend. Prior to him, I had little relationship experience, but I was drawn to his decisive and dependable nature. He expressed his love first and after three years of dating proposed. We married and while searching for a new home and wedding venue, Alex's reliability made everything run smoothly. I enjoyed our life together in the new house. But my mother-in-law Kelly and sister-in-law Joe were a constant source of stress. My father-in-law had passed away a decade ago, leaving Alex's family as just Kelly and 27-year-old Joe. I had minimal contact with them before our marriage and hoped to maintain a polite distance. However, after the wedding, their presence became increasingly intrusive. Kelly began calling almost daily, demanding more money. Can you increase my allowance? I can't live decently on what you give me. Just $200 more would be enough, she pleaded. I told her to ask Alex as he was in charge of finances. She accused me of being extravagant and warned me that not taking care of my in-laws would bring bad karma. Despite my attempts to redirect her to Alex, she blamed me for her financial troubles. Kelly also insisted that I visit her more often, help with chores, and send her favorite foods monthly. While Kelly harangued me over the phone, Joe started showing up unannounced, adding to my stress. While I was cooking dinner, Kelly frequently dropped by unannounced, saying things like, I was in the neighborhood, so I thought I'd pop in. Is dinner ready yet? I'm starving. Hurry up. She would make herself comfortable on the sofa, waiting for me to finish cooking, and then leave after eating. Despite my repeated requests for her to give me notice before visiting and to come less often, she always brushed off my concerns. Don't worry about it, I'm just stopping by. Just feed me whatever, she'd say dismissively. I tried to address the issue with Alex and he did speak to both Kelly and Joe about their behavior. Despite this, I didn't feel it was appropriate to be too harsh with them, given that Joe was Alex's sister. Six months into our marriage, Alex and I finally went on our long-awaited honeymoon in Europe, which had been postponed due to our busy schedules. We enjoyed every moment, unwinding and escaping from daily stress. However, when we returned home after a smooth week-long trip, we were greeted by strange noises coming from inside the house. Panic set in as I wondered if we were dealing with a burglary. Did you hear that? Maybe there's someone in the house. Shouldn't we call the police? I asked Alex, but he didn't seem concerned at all. It's all right, he said calmly, walking into the house as if nothing was wrong. I quickly followed Alex into the house and was relieved to find Kelly and Joe instead of burglars. However, I was puzzled about why they were there. Oh, you're back. Did you bring me a souvenir? The bracelet I asked for? Did you get it? Kelly asked, clearly expecting something. Of course not, it was too expensive, she replied when I said I hadn't. While the three of them chatted away happily, I couldn't help but wonder about their presence. 
Um, why are you guys here? I asked. Callie looked at me with a hint of annoyance. Are you saying our presence is a nuisance? An empty house is an easy target for burglars while you were on vacation. We went out of our way to protect it, so you should be grateful. Apparently, they had offered to watch the house while we were away, and Alex had given them the key. I had told Alex that he should have discussed this with me first. He replied that he hadn't had time because they had approached him at the last minute. What was done was done, so I tried to accept that the house was safe thanks to their efforts. As I looked around, however, I saw the extent of the mess they had left. Every room was cluttered with their belongings. Joe's clothes were crammed into the closet, with the overflow strewn across the floor. In the living room, clothes, bags, remote controls, comic books, and other items were scattered everywhere, not just on the table but also on the floor. After a long flight, I was exhausted and frustrated by the thought of cleaning up all this mess. That wasn't the only issue at hand. I had hoped that once we arrived home Kelly and Joe would leave, but they didn't. It's going to be dark soon. If you don't go home now, you'll be stuck here, I said, trying to be polite. Why don't you let us take it easy today? Kelly responded. Not only did they refuse to leave, but they also took over the living room and started taking showers without asking. They had completely made themselves at home. Expected them to leave the next morning, but there was no sign of them moving out. When I came home from work, they were still there. I told them it was time for them to go. We're family. You don't have to worry about us. Just pretend we're not here, they insisted. Despite their insistence that I ignore their presence, I was the one who ended up cooking, cleaning, and doing the laundry. I felt overwhelmed and frustrated. If I didn't take action, they seemed ready to stay as long as they wanted. I decided I needed to ask Alex to intervene and ask them to leave. As I was tidying up my room, I noticed that one of my limited edition perfumes, worth over $300 and no longer available for sale, was missing. I had been using it sparingly. Panic set in and I asked Kelly if she had seen it, but she claimed she didn't even know I had perfume. When I questioned Joe, she pulled out the bottle from her bag and handed it to me. To my dismay, it was nearly empty. I had been careful with my limited edition perfume, and there was still more than 6% left. When I confronted Joe about the missing perfume, she simply said, It smells nice, doesn't it? My friend liked it too, so I lent it to her. She offered no apology, and my frustration boiled over. Why did you use it without asking? What you're doing is theft. Didn't you learn that stealing from others is wrong? I demanded. Joe brushed off my anger. I only borrowed it for a moment. Why are you overreacting? If you're so concerned, just take back what's left. If you borrowed it, then give me back what you used, I insisted. Fine. But since it's already used, I'll only give you half the money, she retorted. I don't want the money, I want the perfume back, I said firmly. Joe rolled her eyes. You're so unreasonable over a bottle of perfume. I know the brand and it shouldn't be that expensive. She checked the price on her phone and was taken aback. Holy cow, why is it so expensive? Are you really going to spend $300 on perfume? If it's that important, maybe you should have mentioned it. Seeing her reaction, I felt even more disheartened. It's valuable to me, and I only used it inside the house. I never imagined I'd have a relative come into my room and use my things without permission. As we argued, Alex walked in. What's all this fuss about? Alex, she used my perfume and called me a thief, I said, leaving Joe in the living room while I explained everything to him in the bedroom. I'm at my limit. I need you to ask them to leave. Don't get so worked up over something minor, Alex replied dismissively. Also, I haven't mentioned that they're going to be living with us here. My jaw dropped to his unexpected announcement. My mom's house was old and falling apart, so she was considering repairs or moving. We have extra rooms and it's more cost-effective for her to stay here. We decided to live together. Why didn't you talk to me about this? Do you own the house alone? 
I'm paying the mortgage too. Don't blame me, my mom decided to sell her house on her own. I protested. Alex's response was blunt. We're living together now, so if you don't like it, you can leave. His decision made without my input, and his suggestion that I leave left me feeling distant and hurt. I realized my feelings for him were fading. I understand, I said quietly. I started packing the essentials into my carry-on case. Alex didn't try to stop me but remarked that running away after a fight was immature before walking out of the bedroom. Kelly and Joe watched with smirks as I packed and as soon as I left the house, they locked the door behind me. I had no intention of returning. I headed to a hotel and called my boss, with whom I regularly consulted, to request a few days off. During my time off, I searched for an apartment and informed my parents that I had separated from Alex, explaining the situation. They asked what my next steps were and I told them I planned to get a divorce. In the meantime, Alex sent me a text. If you're sorry, you can come back. Mommy and Joe both say they'd forgive you. When I called him to discuss the divorce, he initially resisted, saying, You're divorcing me over this. You just need to put up with it a little longer. Eventually he recognized my determination and agreed to the divorce. From that point, everything progressed smoothly, and the divorce was finalized within six months. I wanted to end things as quickly as possible, so we swiftly divided our assets and I handed over the house to him. We had been married for less than a year and now we were divorced. My friends and co-workers were concerned and curious about what had happened. Initially, I shrugged off their questions, unable to share the details. But as I processed everything, I became more open about the situation. When I told them the full story, their reactions were unanimous. That's impossible. I appreciated the sympathy from my friends and co-workers. It made me feel a bit better, knowing they were supportive of my situation. After moving out and living alone, I threw myself into work with renewed intensity. Instead of spending time on household chores, I took on three times as many projects as usual and even helped out colleagues who were overwhelmed. My boss noticed my dedication and expressed concern, but as I immersed myself in work, the memories of my difficult times resurfaced and I began to blame myself. Despite being grateful for the distraction work provided, Alex called me about five months after the divorce. I had left most of my belongings behind when I moved out, so I answered the phone thinking it might be about that. Alex started by asking what I was doing and if I was living alone. His approach seemed unusual because he was typically impatient with vague conversations. I didn't want to waste time, so I asked directly why he was calling. He said he wanted to get back together. I had no interest in rekindling the relationship, so I said no and attempted to end the call but Alex quickly interjected. Wait, there's something I haven't told you yet. I'm busy, so make it quick, I replied. He continued. Can you lend me some money? I'm struggling to pay the mortgage. It used to be a joint responsibility, so I understand it's hard to manage alone. I knew the amount Alex needed wasn't that significant, but he explained that he had been expecting a raise a few months ago that never materialized. He had also been informed that his performance wouldn't warrant any future increases. Faced with this, he decided to look for a new job, hoping for better conditions. Unfortunately, he only found a lower-paying position and had yet to secure a new role. Regardless of his situation, I wasn't willing to lend him any money. Hold him not to contact me again. You're still single, right? No one will want a middle-aged divorcee like you. You'd be better off reconciling with me, he said. I simply replied, no, thank you, and ended the call. I couldn't understand why I had fallen for and married him. I was deeply disappointed in my own judgment. After that, Alex, Kelly, and Joe all began to harass me. Through our conversations, I learned that they believed Alex was earning a substantial income due to us buying a new house and having a lavish wedding. Since their allowance hadn't increased and Alex had refused to do so, they thought I was the one preventing it. They had been pleased to live comfortably after I left, 
but when they discovered Alex's salary was lower than expected, they panicked. They seemed to think that men were paid more than women, but my salary was actually higher than his. I wanted to block all of them on my phone, but Alex knew where I worked and could easily find me. I was anxious that Alex might call me at work or even show up at my office, so I answered his calls a few times. He consistently complained about Kelly and Joe spending too much money and running out of savings. They had started working part-time but couldn't make ends meet because they spent their earnings so quickly. It seemed like every conversation revolved around money. I hoped that if I told him I was in a similar financial situation, he might stop calling. I decided to use this approach the next time he reached out. That day, as usual Alex called and said, I need money. I don't have enough to pay the mortgage this month. I replied, actually, I'm planning to resign from my job soon. I've spent most of my savings, so I need some money from you. If you think I'm lying, you can check with someone at my work. Alex simply said, I see, and ended the call. After that, he stopped contacting me. When I shared this with a friend, she informed me that Alex's situation was even worse than I had realized. He had ended up with a lower-paying job and most of his salary went towards the mortgage. Additionally, Joe had an affair with her part-time job manager, who was married. When his wife discovered the affair, she fired Joe and filed a civil lawsuit against her. Initially, Joe claimed that the manager had pursued her and she didn't know he was married. However, text exchanges revealed she was aware of his wife's pregnancy and still pursued him. The manager and his wife divorced, and Joe faced a substantial compensation claim. Joe's affair and subsequent lawsuit led to her losing both her job and her friends. Alex's family ended up covering the mortgage and the debt from the lawsuit, effectively living in a cycle of debt. Kelly, meanwhile, complained that her friends had grandchildren while her own children were still single and struggling. Alex often lamented to his friend about his daily arguments with Kelly, his current single status and how women no longer showed interest in him. He had lost weight and looked disheveled, aging far beyond his years. His friend rolled her eyes at his complaints. Had shared the reasons for my divorce with many people, and now this friend was the only one Alex had left to confide in. She was the one who introduced us and felt a sense of responsibility for how things turned out. Although she found his constant drama oddly intriguing, she stayed in touch with him to keep him away from me. As for me, I recently launched a web magazine with a university friend. I left my previous job and invested most of my savings into the startup. Though it's a small venture and I handle many tasks on my own, I am thrilled by the new challenges. Where I once felt daunted by new beginnings, I now manage them with confidence, having grown from past obstacles. I've also started a new relationship with someone I met at work. He respects my feelings and supports me, helping me realize that Alex was not a decisive leader but simply selfish. For a while after my divorce, I doubted that I would ever marry or date again. Now I am able to think positively and cherish the new happiness in my life.